Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Markov Processes. Does anyone have any questions on anything before we get going today? Yeah, okay, so um, problem four, if you, it's the tennis court problem. And if you look at it, not in terms of courts occupied, but in terms of players arriving, the arrival and departure of players, then I think it's, it's something you're more used to seeing. It's a birth and death process. And so um, you can have either, so this is four in the homework, a number of pairs of players in the system be either zero, one, two, three, or four. And then you can have the number of courts occupied being only zero, one, or two. But if you can find the stationary distribution for the number of players, like if I call that like pi, and if I call the stationary distribution for courts occupied something like pi hat, then we will have that the long run probability of there being zero courts occupied that only happens when there's zero pairs of players in the system. So pi zero hat is gonna be the same as pi zero. Pi one hat is also gonna be the same thing as pi one because the only way for there to be exactly one court occupied is for there to be exactly one pair of players in the system. And pi two hat, you have two courts occupied when either you have two players in, two pairs in the system or three pairs in the system or four pairs in the system so my advice my advice my advice would be to deal with this first and then transform it to number of courts and you can deal with the number of pairs of players just as a birth and death process and you can say that people are always coming in at rate three. So if there's no one in there, the arrival rate is three. If there's one person in there, the arrival rate is three. One person, one pair. If there are two pairs in there, the arrival rate is three. Same with three pairs. But if there are four pairs in there, no one else can arrive to the system. So that's where the arrival rate turns into a zero. And if there's no one in the system, the death rate is zero. There's no one there to depart. If there's one pair of players, they're going to finish after an exponential amount of time with rate mu. If there's two pairs of players, they will each finish in an exponential amount of time with rate mu. But the next departure from the system is the minimum of those two times. And the minimum of two IID exponentials with rate mu is exponential with rate two mu. When there's three pairs of players, there's still only two pairs racing to leave because the third pair is sitting on the bench and is not even in the race. So it's still going to there's still going to be a departure at the minimum of two exponential service times and the same when there's four pairs of players. So with that, I'm just going to remind you of this formula and I'll leave it at that. But oh, and those numbers are given. I don't know why I keep knowing that the lambda is given and not the mu's. So every mu in that list is one. And then you can use our birth and death process stationary distribution formula and write out an expression for pi one and pi two and pi three and pi four. And of course there is a pi zero and to find that you need to make them all sum to one. And it's, it's not too bad, especially because you actually have numbers. So once you find those, then go back to relate it to courts occupied. Okay, so the other one I was asked about is six and this is the physician problem. And you were given actual numerical rates somewhere in the announcements because this is hard to do with generic rates. But I did give you the hint that I would look at this, you may have your own approach, as the number of patients being you know, seen by doctors or like in service, I'll say, meaning with a doctor, and the number of patients in the waiting room 
Okay, and due to all of the different criteria given in this problem, you know, if there's one person here, then this person can't come in. Um, the state space here appears to take on um, five different values. One of them could be there's no one in service and no one waiting. Um, there would never, for example, be no one in service and one person waiting because that person could be in service since both the doctors are free. So that's not included, but there could be one in service one and one waiting. There could be I'm sorry, and zero waiting or one in service and one waiting because if if there if the person that comes in after the first person is in service is not urgent, then they don't want to tie up the second doctor. They want to leave that doctor free for a potentially urgent patient. So they make the non-urgent patients wait. Um, other possibilities here are two people in service or with the doctors, zero waiting, and two and one. But it does say that they won't let anyone into the system if there's already one in the waiting room. So there's never two, two. And I would find the Q matrix for this and then solve pi Q equals zero, which this is gonna be difficult if you do it algebraically. That's why I added some, some numbers. So let's just talk about one row of this matrix, but your generator matrix would have a row and column for each one of these. Um, from 1, 1, you can't go to 0, 0 in an infinitesimal time interval because that would mean two things happened at the same time. That would mean that the person that's being treated, that doctor finishes, and that happens after an exponential amount of time with rate mu. And this person would then automatically move into that position as soon as there was a doctor available. So there's no, there's no waiting time. There's no additional waiting time on that. Given that there's one person being treated by a doctor, this person has to wait through their service time. So you can't end up at uh, zero, zero. You would have to have that person leave, this person go in and then leave. That's an awful lot of stuff. So the rate going from one, one to zero, zero is zero. Um, you can't go from one, one to one, zero. Oh yes, you can. I just said I just said it. Uh, you can go from one one to one zero if the one patient in service leaves, because then the other one automatically goes in there. And it's not like two two things happening at once. It's not one patient leaves and another one arrived. Like that person just automatically rolls in there. There's no waiting time for that. So um, if a patient in service leaves, that happens after an exponential amount of time with rate mu, because that's how fast the doctors work. I'm not in the right row, zero mu. The one one entry is gonna be the negative of the sum of the rest of them. Um, I don't think we're going to choose zero because this person can't go in until there is, um, that person's on hold because they are non-urgent. And so if they, they just can't move in here while this person is still here. So this would happen with rate zero, but we can go from one, one to two, one. And this means that we have an arrival of an urgent patient. And that happens with rate lambda two. And so finally, the diagonal entry is the negative of lambda two plus mu. So it's a lot of stuff like that. And again, hard to solve this generically. That's why I gave you some numbers. And you could just do it numerically, but remember your pi of zero, zero, and your pi of one, zero, and if you add all of these up, these do have to sum to one. So that is a, res a restriction here. Okay. So, yeah, um, I got to move on. Um, so hopefully everything else is going well. But today we are starting the MG1Q. And um, the G stands for general service time distribution. 
So the assumption here is that you have memoryless inter-arrival times, which makes them exponential, which makes the arrival process a Poisson process. So you have a Poisson arrival process with some rate lambda. The one, I'm going to skip my bullet here so I have them in order. The, the one means there's exactly one server. And the G means there's a general service time distribution. Not exponential, although whatever we whatever results we find here, if you want to check that you're doing the right thing, you might try plugging in um, that G is an exponential and seeing that it matches the MM1 result. So general service time distribution. And so the picture looks kind of the same. There's a server, people come in and they leave, and there's a person maybe in service and other people lined up back here. So um, I usually have a mu in these pictures and that corresponds to the service rate and it should here as well. It's just that it's not an exponential service. So I am gonna let S be uh, a service time, then S has some PDF that has to be given. So some PDF that I'm gonna call F sub S of S. And you can find the expected value of S given you know that PDF, right? This is gonna be maybe zero to infinity, or you know, if it's a uniform distribution, it would go from zero to one. But as long as I put this PDF in there and that zero outside the right region, uh, it wouldn't hurt to put zero to infinity here. So again, uh, this PDF might be zero for some places, but this is the mean of the distribution and mu's are used all over statistics for means, but in queuing, they denote rates of service. And for the exponential distribution, the rate of the exponential is one over the mean of the distribution. And so in queuing, when you go to a general service time, you kind of generalize that. So you say that um, the service rate is a mu, which again is not the expected value, which totally looks like that if you're not doing queuing. And this is gonna be one over the expected value of S. Um, to solve what I wanna solve here, we're actually also going to need the variance of the service time distribution. So I'm just gonna say like, suppose that the variance of S is just some sigma squared. It'll come up later. So let's let X of T for this continuous time process be the number of customers in the system at time T. And the first thing to note is that this is not a Markov process because we have arrivals and departures and whatever. But if you just come in at an arbitrary point in time and look at this system, where do you go next? Do you go up or down? And when does that happen? You can't figure out exactly what happens next because you need to know how much time already went by for any distribution other than the exponential. The exponential distribution is the only continuous distribution with the lack of memory property. So if you had a gamma distribution or a uniform distribution, if you start looking at the process here and don't see this stuff, you don't know how much time this takes or what the distribution of this remaining service time is because you can't just say, you have to know how much time went by. So that's why it's not markup. You need more of that information from before that point. But it is a stochastic process. You know, it's a, it's a sequence of random variables. Um, and it actually does still have a stationary distribution. Now that stationary distribution does not satisfy an equation like this. And it does not satisfy an equation like this. I got J, oh, this is an I. 
I'm trying to write the pi q equation, pi i, q i, j, because those are things that we develop specifically for Markov processes. And this is not Markov. But we had the Poster property, which actually applies to any stochastic process where the external arrivals are driven by a Poisson process. So we can use pasta. Pasta was not only for Markov chains. So by pasta, Poisson arrivals, seat time averages, we know that the pre-jump up chain, so the arriving customer sees the chain in its stationary mode. Oh yeah, I forgot to finish what I was saying. So this is not Markov, but it still can have a stationary distribution in the sense that you can potentially have some kind of distribution such that if you start with a draw from that distribution, you maintain it. It's just not defined in terms of some PIJs for a Markov chain, but we still have the concept of a distribution that stays the same shape over time. And we still have the concept of a limiting distribution, even if it's not a Markov process. And so the pasta property says that if you have a stochastic process that's fed by externally by a Poisson arrival stream, you can look at the process as an incoming customer looking forward or a departing customer looking backwards over their shoulder. And that is a discrete time process that has the same stationary distribution. And if we choose to be the departing customer looking backwards, then we know exactly, not it's a random variable, but we know how, like if a customer has just left, um, there could be zero people in the system, in which case we'd have to wait for an arrival. But if there is, say, one person in the system after the customer leaves, then we know we have a service time S until the next customer uh, departs or another customer comes in. But like if this was uniform, we'd be looking at the whole uniform random variable and not, you know, an interrupted uniform. So again, the process is not Markov. The pasta property actually applies to not Markov things, just stochastic processes that are fed by a Poisson process. The non-Markov process can have a stationary distribution in the sense that it can settle down to something. The pasta property says we can look just after departures. And I claim that if we look just after departures, what we will have is a Markov process and we can compute its stationary distribution. And pasta will say that the MG1 has the same stationary distribution. That's a lot to swallow. So we have a process, it's not Markov, but it could still have a stationary or limiting distribution. It's just defined differently. It's just defined as, you know, if you can find this magic distribution where you pick your starting values like this and go forward for some arbitrary amount of time, you should be in that distribution. So we still have the concept of stationary, even though it's not Markov and we don't have these PIJs, we don't have that stationary equation. We also still have the concept of a limiting distribution because the number of customers could kind of settle into its different proportions. So we have a process, not Markov, but it still could have a stationary or limiting distribution. The pasta property says that any stochastic process being fed externally, you know, stuff happens inside, but the external entries into the system, if they are coming from a Poisson process, then the people coming in are seeing the process in its stationary mode. And the people leaving when they look behind them over their shoulder are seeing the process in their stationary mode. So in this picture, this is the time of a departure. And there's two people, right? And one's in service. And when that person departs, we drop down to one. So when that person departs and looks back, they see one person in the system. And so we, we do a time embedding of the process just, just after, that's just a little bit to the left of that. And that I claim, I haven't shown it yet, is Markov. And th the reason we're okay is because we're not interrupting any service time. We don't have to worry about like, well, how much service time went by already because we're just beginning a new service. So 
if we discretize it, pasta says it has the same stationary distribution, and I claim discretizing in this way gives us something Markov, which we could handle. Okay, so I'm going to let xn be the number of customers in the system immediately following a departure. This is a particular time embedding. I claim that Xn is a Markov chain. And if so, pasta says that it has the same stationary distribution as the original continuous time process. So that the stationary distribution of Xn is the same as that of X of T. And X of T is what we're trying to learn about. That's our continuous MG1 process. So um, yeah, uh, let, let's just prove the claim. Proof of the claim. Okay, so we're looking at a, a customer departing. I'm gonna, we, we need to define a variable that counts how many people are coming in during the service time of that customer. And we're gonna use the Poisson input stream. You know, we've done these sort of N of S things, but now the service time distribution is different. So let me, let me set up some notation. I'm gonna let YN be the number of customers arriving during the service time of the nth departing customer. The nth departure, the nth departing customer. Um, Yn is going to be equal in distribution. In other words, has the same distribution as, so the arriving customers are following a Poisson process. We've got like an N, um, but we're gonna plug in a service time. So where S is a service time, and those are assumed to be IID according to some given PDF, but no longer exponential. Okay, so let's find, this is not what we care about, this is not the XN, but we're going to need to figure out probabilities for the YN chain, and then relate them back to XN. So note that um, yn being a count is a discrete random variable. So we could talk about the probability that yn is some integer k or something. And this is the probability that n of s equals some k. And how we always deal with things like this, we've got a random process with a random thing plugged in. So we condition on the time of service. So I'm going to say I'm going to go from 0 to infinity. The probability that n of s equals k, given s equals s, I have more to write, but give me a second to move this down, times the service time distribution. So I'm going to plug in the little s, 0 to infinity, probability n of little s equals k, given s equals s, times that service time PDF. I did not put in my definition, this really is the definition, this is not me like suddenly I need this. Part of the definition of the MG1Q is that the arrival process is independent of the service rates. If we get to where I think we're gonna get to today, we're, we're finally gonna see when that's not true at the end of today, but if not, we'll see it next week. So, by independence of the service time distribution, which is an assumption of the model. This is a random variable, this is a random variable, but the um, arrival process is supposed to be independent of the service times. And then, so we get to drop this. And we end up with the integral zero to infinity of the probability n of s equals k times this unknown PDF ds. And I guess we could write this out, but I can't go any further without actually knowing the f. And if you were doing a problem, 
and you knew that that was maybe a uniform PDF, then you would plug in your actual PDF. But right now, all I know is this is e to the minus lambda s, lambda s to the k. And yeah, I can't go any further without knowing the actual distribution. But this is the probability that yn, the number of arrivals during a service period, is some k. And I'm going to call it pk. So this is going to be the probability that the number of arrivals during the nth service period is equal to k. And you can see by, um, by the, the definition, or by what we wrote, and by the fact that the service times are iid, that's also part of the definition, that these probabilities actually don't depend on n. So they're the same for all n. So we've got like y1, y2, y3, et cetera, iid. Um, from the distribution that has, you know, I don't have a name for it, but the distribution that has these probabilities. Why am I putting an n there? From this distribution. Is everybody okay? So let's go back to the XN chain. And we want to show that it's Markov. And this won't take long now that we've got this machinery built up. So note that. Then we'll look at XN plus 1 and how we get it from XN. XN plus 1 is the number of customers seen over the shoulder of the N plus first departing customer. Um, and this is going to depend on whether or not there were customers left behind by the previous departing customer. So I claim that this is yn plus 1 if xn is 0. I'm going to write the other line, but the nth departing customer left 0 people behind. So the n plus 1 departing customer comes in, and the people that will be there when they leave are just the number of people that arrive during their service period. So let me know if that doesn't make sense. And then in the case when um, Xn is one or two or three, the nth departing customer leaves and sees Xn people in the system. The next customer to depart, to depart takes that down by one, and also people may have come in. So this is xn minus one plus yn plus one. Um, so it's quote unquote easy to see that this is Markov because the y's are iid. So where you go at time n plus one, all you need to know is where you were at time n, and then this distribution, which is not dependent on the Markov chain at all. So where you go at time n plus 1 does not depend on where you were before time n. So I'm just going to say Markov and not show it. Here, I'll put clearly, but in quotes. And it's got its own transition probabilities. So um, it's got PIJs. This is a discrete time process. So I want to talk about the transition probabilities for this embedded chain. Uh, it's a little different when you start with 0 than when you start at the other cases, right? Because if you have 0, then what happens next is a little bit different. So starting at 0 customers, um, the probability you go customers. Yeah, they are customers. The probability you go to j. Um, this is representing the probability that xn plus 1 is j given xn is 0. And we just saw that that is the probability that yn plus 1 is j. And we have a name for this probability. This is what we call pj, where that is determined up above and needs the actual service time distribution. And then for i equals 1, 2, 3 on up. Pij is the probability that xn plus 1 is j given xn is i. And because i is greater than 0, 
this is the probability that xn minus one plus yn plus one. So how about it? Yeah. Is j given xn is i. And I'm going to plug in the xn equals i. This is the probability that yn plus one is j plus one minus i given given xn is i. And under the assumption that the um, people that are coming in are not looking at the system and making a decision about whether to come in, they might be looking at the system and viewing it as stationary, but they're not making any decisions about you know, walking away because the service times are slow. Um, this is just like they don't care about how many customers are in the system. This is just the probability that y n plus one is y plus one. Where did my j go? Yeah, that little y should be a j. So j plus one minus i. And we have um, notation for that. This is p sub j plus one minus i, as long as j is greater than as long as i is greater than or equal to one. So let me just recap. This is gonna be p does it hold? When i is zero, it doesn't hold. So it's gonna be p. I'm just gonna do this. We we have to recap it in both cases, but for j, sorry about that, for i, for i equals one two, three on up, it's going to be p j plus one minus i as long as the j plus one minus i is equal to zero or one or two, because this is the probability that the number of customers arriving during a service period takes on that value. And these are the numbers of customers that could potentially arrive. And then it is zero otherwise. And then, yeah, we still have to keep this one separate. This is just PJ. So those are the transition probabilities for the Markov chain. OK. In theory, we could find a stationary distribution. You would have to solve, now that we have the Ps, you would have to solve pi j is the sum over i of pi i pij and this is really really hard um especially if i don't even know those pijs maybe if the service time distribution was really nice and we had something nice here we could do this in general this is really really hard um and is done using a either a laplace transform trick or using something known as renewal theory, which is a um, a subject within Markov processes. So if you look at any stochastic processes book, there's probably a chapter on renewal theory. But either of them, both of them are be kind of beyond our scope. So um, I have no closed form expression for you for a generic service time distribution. However, I claim that pi zero at least. So this is hard to solve. But I claim that pi zero is one minus lambda over mu, just like it was for the MM1. And we could show that using our new trick of, I'm not gonna prove it, I'm just gonna write like one line of this, that the proportion, the long run proportion of time the, sim the system is empty is the expected idle time for a server over the expected idle time for a server plus the expected busy time. That was a new way we looked at pi zero in the last class. And the busy time calculation is the, exactly the same, except instead of conditioning on the service times being exponential, you're going to condition using this generic FS of S PDF. And you don't know that, but you're going to end up with things when going through this. And it's a long computation. It's exactly like the other one. It is not beyond the scope of this course. It's just not a good use of our time. But you can go through the exact proof. 
and change out that exponential rate mu for this. And you won't end up needing it explicitly because you're going to end up with things like uh, lambda s, f s, s, d s, um, where you can say, I'm going to pull the lambda out. And what's left is the mean of this service time distribution. And the mean is 1 over the rate. And that was given to be 1 over mu, even though it's not exponential. Um, so you can get this all in terms of the original parameters given for the MG1Q. And the reason you need to know the variance is because you're going to find yourself needing to compute things like S squared F S S D S. And that is the expected value of S squared. You're not going to have to do this, but uh, and you can get that from the variance of S plus the expected value of S all squared. So if you were given the variance, then you could also do integrals like this. So the expected idle time, the server goes idle. It's still a Poisson, a uh, good point, yeah, I'll get, it's still a Poisson arrival stream. So the time to the next arrival where the idle time breaks is exponential with rate lambda. So yeah, so the expected idle time is one over lambda. The expected um, busy period is gonna end up being what we got before. I don't remember what we got, but when you put them together like this, you'll get this. And so, there, yeah, the question is, is this pi zero the stationary distribution of X or Y? It is X. So Y is just, they're just IID. They are stationary, like, like they, the distribution is not changing in time, but they're totally independent of each other. Um, and this is of XN. So this is for the stationary distribution of Xn, which was the embedded chain just after departures, and and therefore uh, a period. Therefore, by the reverse or departure pasta property, it is also the stationary distribution for the continuous time process for this Mg1q. I should put this is a process, so I'll put brackets. And the other probabilities, you might have a chance with a simple service time distribution, but even then you might not. Um, but there are again, Laplace transform and renewal theory tricks that you could use if you have nothing to do this summer. Check it out. Yeah. Um, why is the number of arrivals during a service time? The MG1Q has people and it's going up and down. And we're looking at the departure times just after the departure of the um, nth customer. So let me look at a departure. This is, this is the first departure right here, huh? We're going up, up, up. So right here, that value is going to be um, like time one, and our x one is going to be two. No, one. No, two. Yeah, because we're up to three here. <laughs> so the third person, the first person to come in, doesn't actually leave until here. And when, uh, and when they look back after they leave. There are two people left in the system. And this picture means that, you know, the first person arrived right here and no one left until here. So this whole thing was the service time for that one person or the first departing person. And while they were in while they were in service, we had one, two other arrivals. So we're saying that. Uh, the number has, has to be the same. <laughs> We're saying that Y1 is two in this case. Um, it is the number of people to arrive during the service time of the nth customer to depart. Yeah, and that's completely determined by the external Poisson process and how long it took them, how, how long their service time was. Yeah, we're definitely in the weeds now. 
there's something we can compute. And I think this is really fun. And in the end of this, we're going to have a formula. And you're going to get to just plug things into this formula on your final homework coming out today. And it will be on the cheat sheet for the final. Um, so let's derive it. And it is the um, expected number of people in the system for an MG1Q in equilibrium. Yeah, I can give you a closed form expression. So um, the people always write this, but I think it's misleading. So I'm going to write this, this title, um, the mean Q length for the MG1 in its equilibrium. It has settled down. When I think of the Q, I don't know about you, but when I think of the Q, I think of the people waiting in line. But this formula is actually the mean number of people in the system. I, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. Maybe it's not confusing, but I wanna say, but in case you're looking it up, this is probably what you would look for. Um, the Q length is the total number in the system, including the one in service. Because this is kind of considered the queue, oops, sorry, the queue we're looking at, not the actual people queued up. But I'm not going to try to trick you at all about this. But yeah, let's try to find this mean queue length for the total number of people in the MG1 queue in equilibrium. So I'm going to use the same setup. We've got one server, we've got a Poisson arrival process with rate lambda. The service times are IID with rate mu and some distribution. Um, the service times are independent of the arrival process, all that stuff. So the same setup and um, you would compute this. So usually you would say, okay, I'm gonna sum as N goes from zero to infinity of N times the probability that there's N people in the system but we don't have an expression for this. So I can't do this. So we're gonna try to be clever. I'm going to let L be the limit as T goes to infinity of the expected number of people in the continuous time system. And I'm going to let xn be um, from the embedded chain. So um, this is going to be the number of customers left behind by the nth departure. OK, so once this thing has settled down into its equilibrium, and yeah, you do need the same sort of conditions that we needed before. Like we're gonna need the arrival rate to be slower than the service rate for this to have an equilibrium. But once it is settled down, you could kind of look at like X infinity, if you will. The embedded discrete time chain with the same distribution as X of T, but it is run forever. So I'm gonna call this X. You know, I don't wanna work with XN and say it has reached equilibrium because I don't want time to be involved in this. So, and I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let X be like X infinity and I'm gonna let X prime be X infinity plus one. That's kind of abusive notation. But what I'm saying is that we've got this chain, it is in stationary mode. The distribution will not depend on N at that point. So I've stopped writing the N. And so this is like XN and XN plus one where you don't even need the Ns, if that makes sense. Okay, so these are two stationary random variables in that host departure chain, like it's gone on for forever. <laughs> and so, the expected, there is a little bit of, you know, worry here about the limit outside the expectation, but the expected number of customers in a continuous time system out there in the limit 
I claim is the same as the expected number of customers of this correctly embedded chain out there in the limit. So I claim that we want to compute L, which is the expected value of X. So this is supposed to be the expected Q length for the continuous time process in equilibrium. The pasta property says we can look at the distribution instead of the post departure chain. And my notation X is like an X infinity for that chain. And because it's stationary, this will have the same expectation at the next time point, which seems a little weird, but we're going to explicitly relate X and X prime right now and use this fact to figure out a nice formula for L for your cheat sheet. So let's do it. Um, note, here's an expression. So let's note that uh, X prime, the number of departures left behind by the plus one departure is whoever was left behind by the previous departures plus a number of arrivals. If I should call this. If I wanted to match what I was doing before, I would call this Y. But I want to call it N because it's going to be a Poisson number of arrivals. And then we have to take away um, the person that left. Sorry. If this is like time n, but n is infinity, and this is time n plus one, the n plus one departing customer looks back and sees the number of people left behind by the previous departing customer, plus the number of people that arrived during the n plus first customer's service, minus one uh, if there was anyone in the system. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say minus like an indicator, an indicator that the original x was greater than zero. OK, so these x's are all like xn's, but n has run off to infinity. And their distributions are all stationary. And we want to know the expected value of either one of these, because they all have the same expected value. And those also have the expected value of like really abusive notation, but like the continuous time process at infinity. So let's take the expectation across here. I'm going to take the expectation on the left and on the right, and I'm going to go ahead and run that across. And I'm trying to solve for the expected value of x or x prime. And big fail here, these are going to cancel. So it's not here. But what I did just figure out is that the expected value of n is, because now I have 0 on this side, is the expected value of the indicator that x is greater than 0. And the expected value of an indicator is always a probability of the event being indicated. So this is the probability that xn is greater than 0. And we know what that is. This is 1 minus the probability there's no one in the system. So this is 1 minus 1 minus lambda over mu. And it is lambda over mu. What a cool way to find the expected number of arrivals, I think, during the service time of the infinitieth departing customer. <laughs> so, but still, this canceled. So, as cool as that is, not helpful. So, now I'm going to take this expression and square both sides and take expectations and see what we can get out of it. So x prime squared is going to be the x plus n minus this indicator squared. And so you have to square this all out. And I was going to do that, um, but I'm going to go straight to the end, which involves a few simplifications. I know. So you would square this out as normal. Um, you would square this out and you would get a lot of terms. And then you would combine them and simplify. And so I'm just going to cut straight to that. But if you are squaring this out, note that a term like x times the indicator that x is greater than 0 is just x. <laughs> because if x is 0, 
this is zero and this is zero and it's zero. But if X is greater than zero, this is one and this is whatever it is. So like there will be a term like that when you multiply this out, but you can change it to just an X. Uh, another term you're gonna find in there is the indicator is gonna end up squared, but because it's zero or one, it's the same thing as the indicator. So go through, square this out, combine like terms, and you should end up with um, x squared plus n squared plus an indicator that x is greater than zero squared, but we don't need to write it, minus 2x, which really came from terms like this, plus a couple of terms with n's in them with a single n that I'm going to combine and kind of factor out. So plus 2n x minus the indicator that um, x is greater than zero. So you could all do this, you just have to square it and use those simplifications. So I'm gonna take the expected value on both sides here and here. And because x and x prime have the same distribution, if you take the expected value of x squared or the expected value of x prime squared, you get the same thing. So these two things circled in yellow, once you take the expectation, are going to drop out. But fortunately, there are some other x's that are still there where we will have the expected value of x, and it will still be in the equation so we can solve for it. So I am going to take the expectation across this, but let's look at uh, a couple of, let's look at the individual expectations. Um, the expected value of n squared is kind of the worst one, so I'm going to leave that for a moment. The expected value of this indicator, we already know this, this is the probability of the event being indicated. This is one minus the probability there are zero people in the system, and that is lambda over mu. The other expectation we're going to end up computing is the expectation of n, a two, yeah, um, x minus, here I'll put the two in, doesn't matter because I'm going to pull out of these pieces back together, but two n x minus the indicator that x is greater than zero. So I can pull the two out. And n is the number of arrivals during a service period. And those arrivals do not care how many people were left behind by a customer. The n is independent of the number of people in the system by the basic assumptions of setting up an MG1Q. So by independence, first of all, I can pull the two out. And by independence, I can break this up into the expected value of n times the expected value of x minus the indicator x greater than zero. The expected value of n, this is the number of arrivals during a service period. Have we already done that? Oh yeah, we did that. We, we did that in a very slick way actually up here. Yeah, expected value of n is lambda over mu. So this is two times lambda over mu. And then I'm gonna run the expectation through here. The expected value of x is what we're trying to find. That's the L. The expected value of the indicator is the probability of the thing being indicated. And we've seen now twice already that that is lambda over mu. So <laughs> if you go back to this and take the expectation all the way across. The only other thing we haven't dealt with is n squared, but that one's a little messy. So I'm going to leave that for now in the formula. Take the expectation going across and solve for the L. You will get, this all implies that L is going to be the expected value of n squared plus lambda over mu minus two times lambda over mu squared over two times one minus lambda over mu. This is gonna be a formula you can plug in chug through on the homework and it will also be given on the final. 
and n is the number of arrivals during a service period. And I'm going to write down its expectation as well. But if I put it in there, it's really messy. I think this is easier to write in two pieces. So let me know. Really, don't be shy. I can I can do this line by line. But all I did was take the expectation through there and dealt with the individual pieces. And then there was an L on the right side, and I solved for L. And that was probably the coolest thing you've seen in the last minute and a half. Actually, I don't know what you're seeing. So if, you, if you're seeing something cooler in front of you in person, let me know. OK, let's get an expression for the expected value of n squared. I'm going to condition on the actual service period time. This is going to be the integral 0 to infinity, the expected value of n squared given s equals s multiplied by the service time PDF, which you might actually have in a given problem. But in general, um, this is the, um, so n given s equals s is Poisson with parameter lambda s. It's the number of arrivals during that time period. And the expected value of n squared, you don't need this anymore once you have taken this into account. Like I can't cross it out there because right now this is the number of arrivals during that service period. But once you figured out this, uh, we will be crossing out that s. The expected value of n squared is the variance of n plus the expected value of n all squared. And for this Poisson distribution, the, the variance of a Poisson is just its parameter. So this is lambda s, and the mean of the Poisson is just its parameter. So this is lambda s all squared. So we've got the integral 0 to infinity of, like once you use the s, then you can cross out this information. But again, I don't want to cross it out there because it doesn't look like I've used the s. And then you will have um, lambda s plus lambda s squared times f s s ds. And we can break this up into lambda 0 to infinity s f s s ds. That's the expected value of the service time plus lambda squared integral 0 to infinity s squared f s s ds. So this is lambda times the expected service time plus lambda squared times the expected service time squared. And the expected service time was 1 over mu. Mu is the service rate. I don't actually know the PDF. And the expected service time squared is the variance of the service time plus the variance of, sorry, the variance of the service time plus the expected value of the service time all squared. And that is the variance of the service time distribution is how we define, we call that sigma squared plus the expected value all squared. Some square brackets here. So to do this, I, I did this same kind of trick. And yeah, that's what gets plugged in to your handy dandy new formula for the expected number of people in an MG1Q in equilibrium. If you want to do a check, I'm not gonna do it. I just, I'm, I'm really kind of getting behind. Um, you can let s be an exponential distribution with rate mu. And then mu will be mu, right? So if s, I'll just get you started, is exponential with rate mu, the variance for s, the variance of an exponential rate mu is 1 over mu squared. And if you plug that in, and plug it all back in here, you should end up with the same expected value of the number of servers in the MM1Q. The MM1Q, don't write this down. Well, you, you can do whatever you want, but this is gonna to be totally disjointed and erased. The MM1Q had 
stationary distribution like this that look like a geometric starting from zero with p equals one minus lambda over mu. The mean for this geometric is one minus p over p. So this is lambda over mu over one minus lambda over mu, which is lambda over mu minus lambda. So that is what that formula, the L, should simplify down to. If you assume that S has an exponential distribution. Um, the relationship between x and x prime, um, we decided to discretize the continuous time process just after the departure. And we were looking at the stationary distribution of this. And so my, my x is like an, like this is the xn chain you know, x1, x2, x3, my x was like an x infinity, and my x prime was like an x infinity plus one. The number of customers left behind by a departing customer in the limit <laughs> versus the number of customers left behind by the next customer to depart. So I could have said like x equals xn and x prime equals xn plus one and assume that the process is already stationary, like it was started in equilibrium. So the number of customers left behind by the n plus first departing customer depends on how many were left by the customer before and how many came in. And, and if that n plus first departing customer was there when the nth customer left, because then they have to subtract themselves and um, yeah. The MG1 is not nice. We can get a few nice things out of it. And, you know, the grad students on the first take-home exam had a problem with robot dogs dropping from the sky, and that problem could be done as an MG1Q, though it wasn't, and I had to get that back to you. I'm going to write up a solution for you so you can see my easier solution for that, but it could have been approached as an MG1Q because satellites were, or ro robots were, were burning out. <laughs> so they had different lifetimes and you could model it as a as a queue with its general service time distribution. I want to write that up. I'll include it on I'm going to give you solutions to both take home exams. So I'll include it on there. All right. Yay. We are ready to talk about uh, a little bit about bulking, which is when you look at the queue and you're like, uh, -uh. <laughs> Um, let's look at the MM1 first. Bulking gets bad pretty quickly. Uh, there's another term in queuing called reneging, which almost looks like bulking. But bulking is when people look, they come in, they look at the number of people in line and they, they're like, no, I'm not joining this, I'll come back. Uh, reneging are people that get in line and then are like, I really have to catch this bus, you know, and leave the line. Um, so right now we're looking at balking. Um, and the simplest and probably le least realistic case is to have an MM1 cube with this extra little uh, glitch. Um, arriving customers choose to join the queue with some probability P or join the system with probability P or walk away with probability one minus P. This one's not all that useful because Why, why did they come there if they were going to leave with that probability? I would think that maybe if the line is long, you know, like some P sub N, um, but that's really hard. We're going to get to it. This is just our, our starting point. So what is the stationary distribution here? The setup is going to be the same, the same um, lambda and mu parameters. 
and the condition for stability and this not blowing up will actually change. Um, but we don't have to start over with a new birth and death process. What is going on here is we just have a thinned arrival process. So people are coming in at rate P times lambda and the people that don't come in are just ignored and they have some rate mu of leaving. So the stationary distribution should look exactly like the, the stationary distribution for an MM1, but with the lambdas replaced with P times lambda. So it is, pi n is one minus P lambda over mu times P lambda over mu to the n as n goes from zero, one, two on up. And we need in order to get this constant when we're finding pi zero and setting it equal to setting the sum equal to one, we need P times lambda to be less than mu, the arrival rate to be slower than the service rate. So we don't have to do anything new. We just can use the thinned Poisson process. OK. Um, Let's do another one that's slightly more complicated. Uh, so still, this is all under MM1, but yeah, still the MM1. And um, if a customer arrives when there is um, no one in, no one, uh, well, in the system, yeah. They they go they join they go right into service. Otherwise, people join with probability p. So we've made it just a little bit different, added a layer of complexity. Um. This this is no longer a thinned Poisson process because more is going on. The arriving customer is looking at the state of the system, and but it is a birth and death process. So what we have is, um, yeah, a birth and death. And our lambda, if the arrival rate, the rate of birth or increase, oh gosh, sorry, I'm over time, really sorry. But or, yeah, I'm just gonna write up birth and death rates and solve for this. So next time we'll have even a more complicated bulking system. And then we'll start putting these things together into networks. And we're going to have a simulation break for the Gibbs sampler at any time. You're not going to know when it's coming. Next time, or not, on Markov processes. <laughs>